Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation or around the world. Once again, you're listening to the VMware Communities Roundtable Podcast. Today is May 1st, Wednesday, 2019. My name is Eric Nilsson, and with me I have my co-host as always, John White. John, how's it going? Hey, 1st of May. There's a famous song that uh, I won't sing here uh, because of my terrible singing voice and the content, but uh, today's Color of the Bay Report. I crossed uh, San Mateo Bridge, blue-green water. It, It actually... Made me think, oh, that's what that seafoam color is, too. A little bit windy. Yeah, a little bit windy, but yeah, beautiful weather. Beautiful. Beautiful weather. Not too hot, not too cold. Just perfect here in sunny California. On the show today, uh, we have Shri. Shri, I'll let you tell your last name. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, what happens once you deploy in cloud services, how to actually go deal with post-deployment issues. Yep, yep. that's so, right. Awesome to have you in the room, as always. Uh, and Shri, thanks for uh, joining us. And we will get to... What, what we're going to talk about there on post-deployment issues. But before we do that, we'll do a little bit of the news. Lots of news going on today. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, mostly because uh, uh, Delta Dell Tech World is well, going yeah. on. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of interesting announcements. I think everybody has heard that uh, VMware announced uh, something on Microsoft. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it look, sounds like, uh, from all the news reports, and, and believe me, folks, we don't have any inside knowledge ahead of time, before they go on stage here, but uh, it sounds like there's a, a, a going to be an Azure offering, uh, VMware Cloud Foundation inside of Azure, kind of like uh, VMware Cloud and AWS. There's a slightly different name that was uh, very shocking to me. Actually, I didn't realize that that was going to happen. Uh, you know, had no clue ahead of time. But um, uh, wow, don't know what to say. Yeah, I gotta to say, some details. Uh, it, it, I tweeted out uh, that. This to me is we're finally in a truly multi-cloud, yep. hybrid cloud era. I know that you know when we are we're in VMUGs and we ask how many people you know are running a hybrid cloud environment, mm-hmm. everybody kind of you know it's like three or four hands, right? right? But now that you have AWS and you have Microsoft and you have your own data center, mm-hmm. the likelihood of you actually moving into a hybrid environment over the next five or ten years is pretty high, right? Right. 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 And so and now being able to you, you see the logic between you know our, our infrastructure and setting up your data center this way so that you can choose uh, which cloud environment best suits your environment. Now we have IBM, uh, we have Microsoft, and we have uh, Amazon. Uh, now you can actually just play one against the other, You know, still move your workload around, load balance your workload across clouds. Um, I, I, I think it's a really good move from a VMware perspective. And it makes today's topics all the more relevant because uh, we're, we've been focusing in the last six months on, you know, Cloud ops, cloud management. What do you have to do to get to the cloud? And so here we are. We've announced uh, being on Azure now. So yeah. really, really, really nice. I I, I don't want it to uh, you know pay short shrift. There was another announcement, and that was the VMware Cloud on Dell EMC. I think it was called. Yeah. Which is the uh, the maturation of the project dimension that that was uh, talked about at at VMworld last year. So that's. Uh, uh, VMware, you know, hardware and software as a service on-prem uh, from Dell EMC hardware uh, perspective, the entire thing being a rental, right? Like, so you just, it's on demand, you know, uh, it's as a service, uh, VMware on-prem for, for you and in, in, in your data center. So th- that's a really interesting offering as well. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, what I found interesting is that they, they also mentioned that there was going to be an API that allowed you to just request from your your application uh, additional additional compute resources, right. Right? right? So you can you can actually just code that into your app. I need X amount, and it'll just give it to you. And I think it gives it in like an HCI hyperconverged infrastructure package, right? Right. Uh, right. Whether it's a rack at a time, I can't remember what they what mm-hmm. they said or blocks in a rack. Uh, but it was it's certainly I I I thought wait we're not back in the cloud business are we? I thought we got rid of the cloud air, right? I thought we were going cloud with uh, Microsoft, IBM, and others, right? Right, um, right? But this is really just about uh, purchasing blocks of HCI machines that are mm-hmm. pre-configured for you. Uh, less about us running the cloud, maybe, but but just giving you the sense blocks that, of machines. The sense that I got was that you're going to get the hardware from Dell EMC. Uh, the software was going to be pro- provided by VMware. It was going to be you know cloud found. Foundi- Cloud Foundation esque, right. but the entire thing was going to be rental, right? So, like, you know, the the access was going to be through, you know, an interface not unlike VMware Cloud on AWS, where it's just 
here is all this infrastructure as a service. You could request right. new compute. Right. You can request you know more storage on, and it just happens to be all be in your data center. You know, for people who need. Oh, that. I didn't pick the your data center yeah. component yeah. of the message. In your data right. So that makes that makes perfect sense yeah. then, right? Just rental of a block of gear, right? Mm -hmm. Rent your, you know, and then have an API. The API kind of ready, interesting, in that you ordered it. Mm -hmm. And then I got the impression that it shipped or it did something, right? right. That, but you could actually just order it from your Power CLI application. Don't know why you do that, but uh, yeah, that makes a lot more sense now. Well, yeah. I think that, you know, obviously there's people, you know, pr who programmatically interact with their infrastructure um, who, you know, they are kind of shielded from the entire purchase of the underlying infrastructure. Hey, I need more compute. I need more storage, I need more memory, whatever, you know, so I just need to increase the amount of blocks that I'm using, kind of like they do in AWS, right? Hey, I need another EC2 instance. Hey, I need more S3 storage. And so they want to have APIs and interact with the underlying infrastructure that way. That infrastructure just happens to be on-prem. And, you know, if it needs to go up in blocks of, you know, whatever, then that's delivered, you know, via, via the VMware cloud on Dell EMC. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, need in, need need announcements there. I think there was one other announcement, but I can't remember what it was. But yeah, there's there been was a handful. A, kind of a joint uh, a VMware Microsoft um, Workspace One thing, where you know if you're delivering um, things via Intune, via uh, Office 365, it can all be managed. That's via, correct. Uh, yeah. Workspace Management one. using yeah. Workspace One through your cloud services yep. provided by Microsoft. Right. So interesting, uh, what's the Microsoft CEO's name? Satya Satya, Satya. Satya. Yeah. Interesting to see Satya, Pat Gelsinger, and Michael Dell all up on stage at once yeah. doing the announcement. Um, just a new era, right? Like a, it feels like a new era. And right. yeah. I know we're not supposed to t talk about, you know, the stock market reaction, but it has been positive. Oh, right? it has so, it? Okay. That's yeah, good. So, so that's good. Um, I had to take it off my phone because I, it was getting too distracting. Yeah, exactly. But it, uh, it, it is a new era. And it is, it, you know, when you start talking about cloud, cloud operations, you know, how long do we, you know, run our own data center? How much do we do cloud ops and mm -hmm. managing even your own data center through tools? Uh, the days of racking and stacking, you know, are still here, but... Uh, well, again, it's we, a blend. As as practitioners, we have right. to figure out where that value line is, right? Is right. is my value to the company that I can install a bare metal host, or is it installing the VMware on top of it, or is it delivering the things that need to go on top of the VMware, right? right? Yeah, exactly. So, all right. Well, great announcements. A lot of fun. Uh, Dell Tech World was actually a lot of meat there this year. So that, yeah. that was actually good. Uh, moving on, uh, we do have VMworld coming up. And so I do have some key dates. I'm just going to announce the key dates uh, every time we're here. I put it in my template for the podcast so nice. that now it's just there. So I'll do the um, early bird access of starts, I think, on 0507. So in a few days here, uh, six more days, you can get the early bird rate and get registered. And why you might want to do that is hotel blocks, oh, if you're yeah. aware of hotel blocks. And in San Francisco, hotels are an interesting thing. We've, Expensive. You know, we get a lot of feedback so. from the fact that we're no longer in Vegas. There's some good, good, good parts to it that we'll be highlighting over the next few months. But also, there is the hotel issue. Oh, so my goodness, yeah. if you get an early bird reg in, you get a wider variety of hotel blocks Absolutely. available to you. So uh, that's good. That's happening on 0507. Then Global Content Catalog starts on 0618. So 0618, uh, Global Content Catalog. And then um, Early Bird Registration, let's see, I want to say ends on 0621. And then Early Bird Registration for Europe um, ends... 0726. So early bird registration for both conferences start on the, same on the 7th, mm -hmm. May 7th. And then those are the end dates. Um, schedule Builder opens up on 0616. Oh, wow. Uh, so that's also something good to know. And then while we're on this, just a shout out to uh, uh, Alistair. Uh, from v, v Brown Bag. So V Brown Bag is going to be doing a call for papers. So interesting point of this year, normally we would get uh, the the call for papers um, 
I don't want to say rejects, the ones that were rejected um, or not chosen for papers. Normally we would take those and me and Alistair would sit down and then do a mail out to everybody that uh, didn't get selected going, hey, we still have slots open in the mm -hmm. community podcast. And that's normally how we would get a lot of people to sign up for V Brown Bag. This year, uh, they didn't open up call for papers to external people. So a call for papers was done in a different process this year. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a big list of you didn't get chosen for your paper. Mm -hmm. So uh, give Alistair some love, V Brown Bag, just Google V Brown Bag. Uh, he's going to get the uh, nominations up by next Wednesday. Oh, okay. And so we'll bring him on the show and talk a little bit about it. But if you want to come to VMworld, we might have some passes if you can't get here on your own. And we're certainly looking for community papers. We're going to have V Brown Bag. We're going to have the theater there. We're going to be live streaming uh, in in San Francisco, so be aware of that. Um, Alistair will be looking for community papers, and uh, we also did call for code papers, and we, we have like 150 uh, submissions in there already, so that's going to be pretty healthy. But uh, Alistair V. Brownbag, IT, focused on IT, practitioners, topics, those things, um, show him some love and look for his call for papers. And then he has to get things in quickly this year. Mm. So there's a quick turnaround time to get them in and get uh, probably 60 to 70% of his papers should be in schedule order when um, it launches. When content calendar launches. They want to they want to actually have more of the community content available for, for, available for people to see, uh, get some stronger commitments from the presenters so that uh, um, it's more part of the show. So we've promised to do a little bit of work there. Um, so that's what's going on. Uh, the conference, obviously, uh, 0825 is US and 1104 is Europe. So that's my weekly, you know, here's counting down, yeah. Yeah. counting down to VMworld, uh, as always. So that's what I've got. Um, do you have any other news that you want to do? We should say hello to the, the people on Facebook, Facebook and on uh, YouTube if we ever get around to publishing that and for the handful of Twitch followers thanks a lot for saying hello and following me on Twitch so live stream all over the place it's great <laughs> you got any kind of news yeah. you want to wrap up with I have um, some uh, VMUG meetings that are taking place uh, today you are hopefully at Halifax um, tomorrow North Central Wisconsin VMUG meeting in Eau Claire uh, the Silicon Valley VMUG also May 2nd uh, the Myrtle Beach VMUG in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina is on uh, May 3rd. Also uh, Prince George uh, in uh, British Columbia, May 3rd. May 6th, El Paso VMUG uh, in El Paso, Texas. May 7th, the Charlotte VMUG, Charlotte, North Carolina. And then uh, it looks like there's a meetup uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Orlando on May 8th is their user con. And then uh, UAE VMUG event uh, on May 9th. Southeast Idaho, May 9th. London, uh, May 9th. And let me see. I think that might be. Oh, no, I take that back. Wichita, Kansas, VBeers, number two, also on May 9th. Christchurch, New Zealand, May 9th. And uh, the El Contro VMUG meeting in uh, Brazil also May 9th. So I think that'll catch us up to next Wednesday. Nice, nice. So everybody get out there, get to, get to your VMUG meeting. You know, don't be a stranger. All right, on with the show. So Shri, welcome to the to the show again. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, how long have you been at VMware, what have you done in the industry to get you to this point, and then then we'll get into the, the topic. Sure. Thank, thank, and thanks for having me. Tell me how you pronounce your last name. Upade. Upade. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Uh, th thanks for having me here, and happy birthday. Oh, you. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 27. <laughs> Plus 30. I saw your tweet with, you know, the resistors. Oh, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. My kit. son last night, we, we, we did it, and, uh, you know, I do the Raspberry Pi stuff. Right. Um, but a lot of the sensors, some of the sensors need to keep certain pinouts high, yeah. Uh, and or low, and so you connect it to ground. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to put a resistor in there, and you only you know you have to put like a very high K resistor yeah. because that way it's not really a short. There's just a very small drain, mm -hmm. but that'll drain a, a 1.5 volt pin from high to low 
right? Without causing a short, short because right, you right. have a super high okay. resistor value, right, like right, a right. one meg. So those are always hard to find and different things need different resistors. They make like a $10 little packet that, uh, yeah, that gives you, you know, <laughs> 25 different, you know, various resistors, 10 of each of them or something. So yeah, super cool. But it is my birthday. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for doing, doing, giving me a shout out. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, I work here uh, at VMware as a public cloud advocate. Um, I'm a newbie to VMware. I joined uh, just before Thanksgiving last year. Not and bad. That's a, that's not that's almost not newbie anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like almost six around months. here. It's like you're you're becoming a professional old guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and I, I currently focus on cloud operations and cloud security. And before this, I was working at uh, Cisco and NetApp, where I was a technical marketing engineer focused on uh, DevOps processes and orchestration and automation uh, in public cloud and also hybrid cloud environments. And uh, that's where I got you know hooked on to uh, AWS. I've been doing uh, public cloud since 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a pretty long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right at the beginning almost. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, those are the days when Amazon had EC2 Classic and you know other stuff. Right. Um, and and at NetApp, I actually, as a matter of fact, I worked closely with VMware. Uh, I worked on VRA, VRO, and VROps uh, products. So we had joint collaterals, and I was part of that, working with essays from VMware and building hands-on lab for VMworld and stuff sure. like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, because NetApp was definitely one of those partners that had hands-on labs. Exactly. At VMworld. It's, yeah. It's a little known fact that like you can, as a partner, like you can actually develop your own hand, HOL, hands -all, yeah. have it published and, and have access to it and, and not, you know, NetApp is one of the few that took advantage of that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm new to VMware, but not to the ecosystem itself. So sure. I, I'm right. aware right. of, you know. And in the Bay Area, in, in, in Silicon Valley, pretty much for your career. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, then you come to VMware. VMware. How did they recruit you into VMware? So yeah, I was just talking with John just before we started the podcast. Uh, one of my friends uh, referred me uh, to this position, and you know, and yeah, I was that's like, all yeah, it takes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And I'd heard all, all good things about VMware. I have like a lot of friends here who have been working. So that was also another. Yeah. I tell people thing. that are new that VMware is really fun because it's a yes company, right? right. Uh, it's almost like going to a big university mm -hmm. versus a small university. I went to both, a small and a big. And when you work at a small, you're looking for things to do when you're at a small university. And there's just a click of people. And you're then you go to a big university, and it's like it's the direct opposite. Everybody's pulling at you. There's so many things to do. Yeah. VMware is like that. VMware is a yes company. There's so many things that you can do, and everybody wants to do everything, and everybody's really positive. And sure, we can do that. Let's help us out. Mm -hmm. um, so, and there's you know sometimes budget. It's easy to it's easy to do things. Totally here, agree. Right? Yeah. Versus when I was at Sun Microsystems, everything was a committee. Right, you know, it was like a no company. You basically had to get a committee, do a paper, do a presentation. You know, get that presentation's feedback. A year later, you might get an idea approved. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Where VMware is the opposite, but then VMware, you have to try to figure out what not to do because there's just right. a lot of things you can yeah. do. So yeah, cool, good. All right, and uh, now you, now you're you're heavy into cloud, and today's topic is, uh, you know, obviously now that you're on AWS, how do you remediate issues that you're you're seeing? So yes. why don't you take us through the problem statement, and then we'll dive deeper. Yeah, sure. So uh, we all are using you know automation orchestration tools, right? Whether it's Terraform, uh, uh, Cloud Formation, or maybe VRA or CAS or things like that, and it makes it uh, easier to deploy your applications, your instances or containers or whatever you may have. Uh, once you have it up and running, uh, you want to ensure uh, that the apps that you are deployed are secure, right? The infrastructure itself is secure. And one of the things that you'll hear always the cloud providers talking about is the shared responsibility model, right? And I think there has always been uh, some you know, misunderstanding uh, within customers and also the users of cloud like AWS says, hey, you know, we are HIPAA compliant and we are PCA compliant and we are, you know, all of these things. And they assume that if I run my application or if I use one of their services, I am also compliant and I am also, you know, secure. <laughs> right. And, right. 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 Yeah. So th that's not true. Uh, so the shared responsibility model basically means that whatever is the data center, right? In, in our traditional sense, we have our on-prem data centers where we own the whole stack, network, compute, storage, and the real estate itself, right? Mm -hmm. 
So everything is with us, so it's easier to manage. But in case of the cloud, network compute storage and the data center is owned by the cloud providers. So the security of that, whether it's physical security or the security of the services which run on that, is the responsibility of the cloud provider. But right. the apps that you run on those, right, if you use EC2 or uh, if you use RDS or S3, now it's your responsibility. So if you misconfigure those instances, sure. right. cloud providers are not liable for that, right? So you have to protect uh, your applications and you have to you know, manage the risks associated with that. It's like if you live in an apartment building, the apartment provider is uh, responsible for front, front door and the front gate. Exactly. But if you leave your door wide open, that's your fault. That's your fault, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and, and then that could lead to a lot of risks, right? Uh, so the cloud providers are pretty, you know, uh, solid with maintaining the security posture and things like that on their infra. But when it comes to us, we again have, you know, similar problems what we had in traditional uh, ways, but the way to handle them, you know, changes in the cloud, right? We still have net network risks, which is like DDoS attacks or intrusion, things like that. We still have application risks meaning your uh, software packages you have used in your application have not been patched, right? There are vulnerabilities with them. And then there is, again, compliance and governance-related risk, right? Who has access to what data and uh, which resources have been, you know, let's say encryption has been enabled or not and uh, things like that, whether the ports are being protected, applications are being protected. Right. And it does, so there are some similarities, but there are some differences as well. All right. Yep, yeah, yeah, makes sense. So that's the, that's the problem. And now, when you're in a cloud, there's it's just like there's so many SaaS offerings. I, I got to imagine that the way you're actually there's opportunities to address these problems differently than if it's in my own data center. Or mm -hmm. maybe you can just take advantage of tools and things. So we can talk about that. But before we do, I just kind of I just want to know like when stuff gets stolen out of the washing or dryer, who's 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 responsible? Is it the owner or is it the building, right? Because you know. it's it's the owner, right? You you had to be sitting there watching your, your wash. You just have to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this explains a lot. Okay, yeah. got it. Got it. All right. So so all right. Now we've framed the problem, right? Um, mm -hmm. What what is VMware? What's VMware's role in this? Why, why are we here? So, uh, yeah, so we are seeing that our customers, you know, uh, are, are are on this path of migration, right? They want to use hybrid cloud architectures, which means, you know, vSphere everywhere, right? It's on-prem and vSphere in, on AWS or Azure or anywhere. And then they are also moving to, some of them are also moving to public cloud-only offerings. And we want to be there, uh, you know, wherever our customers are there, and we want to provide them with solutions. So that's where, you know, today I'll be talking about uh, VMware Secure State, uh, which is a real-time configuration security and compliance uh, monitoring tool, uh, which we have. Uh, and I'll, sh I'll basically talk about how, uh, you know, uh, these solutions can be built around this and how you can leverage this, like off-the-shelf tools or, you know, you're free to build your own. But I want to emphasize on what the process is in remediating issues or violations within the public cloud. All right. All right. So secure state, right? Yeah. I, I don't think I have heard anything since Tom Korn came on a podcast like maybe two and a half, three years ago, uh, where he was just visualizing why VMware might want to be in this space. And mm -hmm. now we fast forward a year or two. And uh, where are we on our product journey? So, yeah, we acquired, uh, I think, Cloud Codeu uh, was the company which we acquired uh, almost uh, last year. And we are currently in beta and we'll be in uh, GA pretty soon and once we are in GA I know you can go and access the service at cloud.vmware.com and under our SaaS services you know you can choose uh, secure state and you can have a 30-day free trial so I remember when we did this acquisition you know one of the advantages was um, just automated uh, almost like an audit of your environment to say hey you have this s3 bucket Mm -hmm. It's misconfigured. It's just publishing, you know, your, your permissions say anybody can read it. Yep. And we've heard over and over again, you know, these giant breaches. And then fundamentally what comes down to is somebody had like a, a you know, a storage bucket that was misconfigured, misconfigured. and, mm -hmm. and you know, all this data was stolen. But I, I imagine it's not just that, right? Because, you know, if it was just that, then, you know, there'd be 400 different tools, you know, yep. including open source tools that would be yep. able to do that audit. But but it, so, I'm guessing it's a whole bunch of things. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, th those are the, you know, uh, basic uh, things that the platform can detect, right? Mm. Uh, 
like I was mentioning, compliance and governance is really complex topic uh, when it comes to uh, yeah, cloud providers. Uh, you know, some of the reasons being, you know, they're releasing a lot of services at very rapid pace, right? right? Today you have, you know, one version of, you know, RDS and tomorrow you'll have like five different versions of databases. Mm -hmm. And your developers would want to use that, right? Because they want to get their product, their application, faster time, like to the market at a faster rate. Second is the dependencies between these services, you know, is it gets very complex, right? So now if you have to spin up a EC2 instance, you know, you create a VPC, you create a subnet, subnet and then you create a EC2 instance attach, attach a security group mm -hmm. back when I started around like in 2013 mm -hmm. you could create a EC2 instance uh, without a VPC right just so could, yeah just <laughs> just spin it up right yeah. so the, so these dependencies and the relationships between these services you know keep changing and it's very hard for someone to keep track of you know how they are making these changes right and if you use a lot of services like machine learning services or s3 like you were mentioning text recognition, image recognition, you know, it's it's almost, you know, uh, impossible to keep track of that. And and this problem just, you know, becomes 2x, 3x, depends on the number yeah, of cloud sure. providers you right, use, right, right? right? And everyone has their own way of uh, doing things. Well, I, th I have a feeling that it's not a linear complexity, it's exponential complexity. Ex yes, right? exactly. Yeah. And also the last but not the least, right, uh, identity and access management. Uh, if you mm -hmm. see my laptop, you know, this is my, the most important thing sticker <laughs> like <laughs> I put it on the top uh, just because it's it's the piece that is holding all of this uh, together and in case of public cloud providers unlike our uh, traditional data centers the users can have policies right users can have permissions assigned to them so it provides them with access to what they can access or what they cannot but uh, you can also assign policies to the instances themselves so your EC2 instance can have a permission which allows you to get access to your RDS instance or S3. The good thing about that is uh, your developers don't have to store the keys on the instances right. themselves. <laughs> but the bad thing is if you are uh, assigning an admin permission to one of the EC2 instances, you know, anyone can SSH into it. If someone has the key, they can SSH and they can do anything they want. Right. You have noticed right. that. Ex yeah, <laughs> I've gotten keys right because yeah. we run stuff there, and yeah. it's like right. uh, my my guy that's my developer, right? Just yeah, yeah, yeah. here, here, here's the key, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like that's it, like not <laughs> just a key. Yeah, yeah. So you know that that's why it gets very uh, complex, and that's where you know uh, tools like VMware Secure State uh, can come and help you in understanding uh, these violations. Right. So how does it do that? Maybe we should drill into the product a little bit more. Like, uh, mm -hmm. And then it, it, there's one thing, like what, what, what is it actually doing? Uh, and then two, where does that, how does it manage boundaries between applications, all of that? Like, what, or does it not bother doing any of that? You just okay. talk more. Sure. So, uh, so this is, uh, so configuring VMware Secure State is pretty easy. Okay. You don't need any agents. You're not installing anything or, you know, you're not deploying anything of that sort. All it needs is it needs permission to access your uh, logs, mm -hmm. right, from different services within cloud providers. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, the infrastructure itself is owned by the cloud providers. So earlier on-prem, we could get the logs by ourselves, but there mm -hmm. you have to use their services to get logs. So some of the just good practices, whether you use any kind of you know compliance tool, is always enable uh, VPC flow logs, right? Okay. Uh, that allows you to find out information about what is going on in my cloud network, right? Second, enable services like CloudTrail or Azure Activity Log, which basically tells who, when, and what API operations were performed within your infrastructure, right? So that gives you API context. And then enable services like Guard Duty or Azure Threat Protection. And what they do is they identify any particular anomalous uh, patterns or activity happening on your instances. Let's say someone is trying to do SSH brute force attack, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it can alert you about that. And what Secure State can do is Secure State can ingest all of this data and make sense of it and lay it on top of a data model which we have built within the platform itself. And what this data model does is it can uh, understand the relationship between, like I mentioned, the service dependencies, complexities, right? It can understand that and it can show you a you know, layout of how things and services are connected to each other. 
how does the data model get built? You said it's in right. we have it, but but I would assume that depending on what applications I'm using, what I'm doing, my data model might be different. Or? Yes, exactly. Right. So so the service is based on let's say you use S3 okay. and right. EC2 right. only, right? Okay. So it will show you the relation between hey your EC2 instance always tries to access you know this right. particular okay. S3, right. or you could you, you could be using more other services like RDS, or you could be using you know Redshift. Right. So it, that that would change, but it can uh, it can it can basically detect violations based on the rules that you set. So okay. So there's a rules engine. Yeah. Right, exactly. Right, there's okay. a rules engine. Right. I'm against, setting up my rules engine across those services. If I have new services, absolutely. I can add more rules to that services, and it's all at the network layer. Exactly. Right. And, and and at the network layer as well as you know at the application layer. Okay. More more often, right? Uh, because of the services that uh, AWS and Azure provide. So you, we could do right. like oh, okay, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And we, and we can do like uh, like John, you were mentioning simple violations. We can detect things like hey, you know, the S3 bucket is open to public, your SSH port is open, right, to the public, or your RDS instance is not encrypted, or let's say your user has not rotated their passwords or their keys, right? These are simple things. I mean, you right. could right. Uh, which we detect, but uh, Secure State can also detect something called as complex violations. Right. Uh, Ooh, that's intriguing. Yeah. <laughs> My ears just perked up. Ooh, complex <laughs> violations. Tell me about that. Yeah. So the, the, these are violations which are usually uh, composed of smaller violations, and they are not evident just if you look at them. Right. We call it connected threats within Secure State. Uh, do you guys watch Game of Thrones? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay. So I'm not going to give any spoilers. Don't okay, give but any spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I watched episode three and it was really good. Good, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't seen it yet, it's really good. It has amazing background music too. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so uh, like if I were to show, you know, I'm, I'm going to take an example. I have three pictures, right? I'm going to show a picture of uh, a white walker, right? Mm -hmm. And you might think, hmm, you know, that's bad, right? right? And then I can show a picture of your favorite character, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, standing in the snow, I guess, right. right? And then you might be like, huh, you know, that looks unusual. Mm -hmm. And then you might see some spear or a sword. Right. Mm -hmm. You'll be like, okay, that also looks shady. And mm -hmm. But all of these three are, you know, uh, different issues, right? right? But when you put them together, you might see that the White Walker is probably going to stab your favorite character, right? right? right. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's not happening, right? right, right. <laughs> I'm not going to allow that. So what we do, uh, we do something similar within Secure State, right? So one of the examples uh, that I like to give is, uh, let's consider we have two instances, right? EC2 instances. One of them has public facing uh, IP and one of them is private. So yes, there is a violation, right? But you should not have any of your SSH ports open to the entire public. Either it should be your enterprise IP addresses, right? Or your VPN or your personal laptop or whatever uh, you might be using. Second, uh, I can assign uh, policies to instances themselves, like unlike uh, unlike uh, on on-prem data centers. So I can say this EC2 instance has admin policy. So let's assume that I'm attaching that policy to my private instance. Still sort of okay because mm -hmm. you know I can say that hey, you know this is a private instance, right? No one right. is going to get to it. But now if I use the same SSH key, right, for these two instances, which more often so people tend to do that right. while deployment, right? They're like, okay, I'm going to attach, let it use this admin key, right? Right. And now if I do that, so you can think of it a like... A chain of attacks, right? Now there's a chain of attack, right? Yeah. So if me as Sri, if, even if I don't have admin permissions, but I have the SSH key, I can get into the management box because it has public IP. And then I can hop into the private box, which is also using the same SSH key, mm -hmm. and I can do anything because that box has admin permissions. Right. So Sri, without even having admin permission, was able to change anything. Right. And guess what happens when you look at the logs within AWS infrastructure? It will show you that the instance made the change. It will never show you that Sri was the one who oh, SSH. Really? Right? Oh, okay. Right. And that is uh, such a complicated thing to, you know, deduce just by looking at simple violations, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to look at all of them together and build that graph to actually deduce that, hey, you know, there's a violation. So uh, Secure State can do, you know, things like that. Wow, okay. Because it's interesting, I have to say, again, going back, almost every security breach that I've seen uh, does involve a chain of, of responsibilities. Like, 
oh, this this port got left left open, you know, for this, and then this other thing, you know, was compromised and connected to this, and then this other thing got in here, and then they got access to the important information and were able to get in. So uh, it's that chain. Uh, oh, that's so interesting. Complex. Right. Okay. Okay. Mind blown. <laughs> yep. Interesting. Yep. Um, so it's it's out there. It's in beta, right? Yeah. Um, does it run? It, it, it obviously runs across uh, cloud services. Does it run internally if I have my own? Uh, my own vSphere implementation that I want to look at same kind of relationships? Uh, not not no. yet, okay. uh, because, you know, we started first as cloud first approach, you know, uh, within our portfolio, we have some tools which have, you know, grown from on-prem to the cloud. And there are some mm -hmm. tools which are, you know, like Wavefront, we have Cloud Health, which have grown from cloud to on-prem. Mm -hmm. So currently, you know, we are in the phase where we'll be supporting uh, public cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and then we'll, you know, uh, add more services right. as we go along. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, when um, we, we've we bought this, uh, how many years? When did you say we we I acquired think, this? Uh, around Feb February, March. February, probably March, last year. Right. Yeah, uh, you're 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 almost at, uh, at at beta, or you're you're nearing beta. Can we talk about when it's going to actually be available? I can't comment on the exact date, but it's going to be pretty soon. Okay, uh, good. And yeah. are, are you going to be at VMworld talking about it then? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll be at uh, VMworld talking about it. Uh, I'm also going to be at AWS Reinforce. It's their new security conference. Reinforce? Yeah. Reinforce. Oh, wow. It's in Boston. Yeah. Boston. Okay. What? When? When? I think 25th, 26th of this June? month? Of June. Of June. Of June. Okay. Of June. Interesting. All right. So um, you guys haven't really started to track features yet or know wh where you're going because you're just getting the first set of the features out the door, right? There's probably no HOLs for it yet, um, anything yeah. like that, right? So so where do you start learning about this? You just wait until it comes out, then read documentation, I would assume. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can definitely, uh, you know, go on our blog. It's cloudjourney.io, uh, you know. Right. Where we post a lot of stuff, uh, not just about any particular product, but also about technologies and different things you can learn about Istio, Kubernetes, or you know, Wavefront, Cloud Health, whatever it may be. Or you can also go to cloud.vmware.com, and uh, you know, there is uh, quite a bit of uh, material out there on Secure State as well. So security is moving. This seems like almost a point product, right? Like I, I look at, at kind of like the application layer and building a framework for when applications are talking back and forth. Mm -hmm. Does this does this go all the way up? I get the services from you know the cloud vendors, right? And looking at log files, and then they have APIs that allow you the, the secure state to connect to those and and you know mine data and you know look at your models and aggregate data mm -hmm. and figure out what the policy violations are. Um, do you go up the stack when I'm starting to build, you know, applications? Um, you know, I'm building web apps, right? And, you know, I'm using Apache or I'm using any any of the, the common web servers. Where, do, where does this tool stop with regard to, like, if I'm building, um, you know, modern apps, cloud native apps, where I have microservices running around and I have a whole bunch of microservices, am I looking at their interactions too? Would I use, you know, the template or the ability to, you know, build modules to track things? Where does this stop? Stop, yeah. yeah. So we don't go uh, currently, right? We don't go yet inside the application itself, right? We won't do... Uh, we don't want to go inside the package and look at your vulnerabilities or things like that yet, mm -hmm. right? What we do is at the uh, configuration and governance, right? Who has access to what, how the resources should be configured so that they can talk to each other. Uh, we also have our own app, which we had built and which we deploy using Terraform and Ansible, right? And then we use Secure State to look at uh, how they are talking to, whether, you know, my web server, uh, like you said, Apache, does it have access to my database? Right. Yes or no, right? So we can deduce uh, those things because of the you know data model and the topology that we have. All right. When when you see a violation, mm -hmm. how do you report it out, and what what does a secure case secure state do when it does find a violation? That's a good question. Yeah. So uh, when a secure state finds a violation, uh, you have various ways of you know alerting to the user, right? 
uh, irrespective of you know uh, what you do the process is always you know in a continuous security model the process is always to first detect right investigate notify and then remediate mm -hmm. so detect and investigate uh, you know is done by uh, secure state for you and it can notify you uh, via email you can get an email alert or you can get a slack alert uh, and then you can remediate the issue and you can use uh, you know uh, the data that secure state sends you so secure state will basically send you in an alert it will say which object which region which cloud account which cloud provider and what was the problem and it will also you know redirect you to knowledge based articles as to you know why why secure state thought that this was a violation or i can definitely see you you want like almost like a, a separation right in any kind of security operations model if you're going to give a tool like secure state access to all the logs and and you know interactivity you all, you don't also want it to have the ability to write out configurations right? why not <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but, but yeah to that point you know uh, we are also working on something called as a remediation uh, engine mm -hmm. where you will have the ability if you want secure state to do that on behalf of you, mm -hmm. secure state would be able to do that as well, oh, right? Okay. Uh, because some customers might want to say, hey, you know, uh, these things happen often. I don't want to spend my time, you know, let's say my my developers always go and create a S3 and they forget to make it private, mm -hmm. right? And I don't have to always go and, you know, block that thing. Right. I want this system to detect, notify me, and then go and fix those. Right. And maybe for some things, I, I want to take control, right? Let's mm -hmm. say I have a production app running and I get a violation. I want to first make sure that, hey, you know, everything is okay, you know, before I flip the switch. Yeah. So change, you could right. choose that as well. Yeah, I can see, like, for, for some security things, like, you know, you have information in S3 bucket, you want it fixed right away. Exactly. You don't want to wait for, you know, <laughs> something to happen and then, right. yeah. Yeah, that just seems to be a Terminator movie, movie that reminds me of, hmm. you know, something that watches and then takes action, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, locks you out, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can't get back in and yeah. now it takes over. I can, I can, I can see that. Um, yeah, so no AI capabilities yet. Um, we, are, we are building uh, those as well uh, oh, wow. because that, that's how we'll be able to, because we have all the data within our platform. Right. And that's how we'll be able to give you better insights when you're going across the cloud, right? You might have, you know, user one accessing using AWS as well as Azure, and then you want to detect, you know, some patterns and provide valuable insights. To secure state monitor itself? We do that. Yes, we, it's, you know, log for, we monitor the secure state <laughs> environment in production, which we have deployed using secure state. Okay. <laughs> Right, there's a, there's a loop there, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, because that's one of the, that's one of the things that uh, you you start to create vulnerabilities in you know the application that you're giving permission to monitor, right? And mm -hmm. if you know if you know anything about hacking, rule number one of hacking is make sure you erase your trail when you get in there, right? So that, yeah. so that nobody knows you're there. And so that's so, why you're trying to ingest the logs real time instead of going back forensically and doing it. Right. Exactly, right? Okay. That's one of the capabilities of Secure State. If you, there are a lot of tools out there, you know, where, which use continuous API calls, like they make repeated API calls to AWS to get information. The problem with that is API calls, there are limitations on AWS. You can't just make unlimited number of API calls, right? So what they, what they recommend is, okay, we'll do an API call every five minutes. But now it's not real time anymore. Right. <laughs> and I can do like Eric was saying, I can come in within five minutes, get your data, erase the trail and just go out. You won't even know. Right. Right. So or you by the time you know, it might be too late. So that's one of the nice things about secure state that as soon as a violation happens right away, you will get a alert. I, I got to come back to the knowledge base, right? Also, because I think that's key too. Because the one is de determining the pattern of a violation, right? But then being able to give it to me as an, uh, an a cloud operator to realize what's what severe, how severe is this, right? Is this something that is just a misconfiguration, or is this really something malicious, right? Then there's there's most of the things we go track down are not malicious. They're just because we just had poor maintenance and some bot is right. spamming us. Bang Hanging at our ports or whatever, and so the the knowledge base where you're updating to give me kind of okay, this is what's actually happening. Oh mm -hmm. wait, there's some other things. That's that's actually really important 
to, to have there for operators? Is it things you read? Is it a dashboard? How do I get taken to the, a knowledge base? Yeah, so it's basically, you know, a web page. So whenever you get an alert or you can go uh, log on onto Secure State dashboard as well. And we have based on cloud providers, we have knowledge articles uh, for particular services. So, yeah, yeah, like this is S3. Just, yeah, I'll if you get an S3 yeah. port, op- let's say S3 public access alert. Right. What exactly does this mean, right? It's good that you know you find found it, right. but what exactly does it mean, and how can you fix it? Like if you were to do it, but just by yourself, or you want to use your CI/CD tool to you know go and fix it for you. Got it. Right. Right. Yeah, I think that's going to be the key to most of security. Is that there? I feel like I'm overwhelmed with the amount of security there needs to be in a modern cloud yeah. app. And it's like, how do I simplify this? How do I get it to a point where it's just digestible and I can actually just see the few things that I really need to worry about and let somebody else worry about the things that are not, or don't worry about them at all, right? right. That, that <laughs> these are just things that will process for you. Yeah. And and I feel like this space for, for an IT guy that comes in and then starts having to deal with cloud security it's it's kind of overwhelming right? it, yeah. yeah definitely with the number of you know services uh, they have and right. the number of services developers want to use as soon as it's they're released oh wow and when you're it's, when you're building an app uh, because we build apps right we never stop and think okay so what's the bur- what's the security burden for this app this right? Right. when yeah. we're you know we think about how to run it what GUIs we need but we never actually think about okay there's going to be X amount of security you're going to have to worry about when you're using 15 different microservices from these different you know places right and you know nobody and then we worry about it only when we built the app deploy the app and then we have problems right? <laughs> exactly right, right. No, yeah no. I mean that that's that that's the principle uh, you know behind continuous security model is that you don't do that right right you have to ensure that security checks are embedded as a part of your development process itself, right? Mm-hmm. If you're using a CI CD tool, make right. sure that there is some static analysis code done right away. And if something fails, fail it right away, right? Don't let the application deploy and then, you know, get some tape to start fixing it within production, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that, so as a part, matter of that, you know, at the final stage after you deploy, that's where, you know, secure set can come in it can validate for you and as soon as it is deployed it can alert you right. meaning let's say you have a dev environment you deploy and you have secure state set up there secure state can let's say gives you 100 violations so you can go and fix your terraform template or cloud formation or anything right, right. and now when it goes to prod you should not see right. you know those right. violations but if you still see them it means something is going wrong right it's right. a very good information so where does this fit into the kubernetes framework where i'm deploying apps kubernetes managing you know my githubs my docker images and then my test staging and production servers uh do, are there hooks that plug in here yes uh, we, we are working on adding you know uh hooks to uh kubernetes itself right uh, whether you might be using native services like eks aks Right. or uh, you might have your own deployment of Kubernetes. Uh, right now, it monitors all the instances and all the native services like RDS, uh, S3, and Redshift, and things like that. Okay. It's interesting. I, I imagine that there's going to be... like I, I know that we have other um, offerings in the space, like uh, I would say NSX Service Mesh, right? Which mm-hmm. uh, kind of intermediates uh, the... Um, microservices speaking to each other right so it has its own security model like user access model you know minimum permissions so then uh you have these layers you have different things. different layers at yeah. which they operate yeah exactly yeah and then those services like you mentioned those services might also be using cloud services right, right. Uh, the they end. might access something else out mm-hmm. there so at that point as well you need uh something like secure state which is monitoring all of this right Mm-hmm. Right, right. So we 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 have uh, we we started a quarter after, so we're running till quarter after. Hopefully, pe- people don't uh, feel too bad that we're keeping you a little bit late. Uh, but um, that gives us maybe another seven minutes or so. Uh, I always like to kind of come through and say, so what are your plans for the rest of the year? What keeps you up at night? Uh, what are you most excited about? So maybe we can touch base on that. Sure. Uh, so what keeps me up? Probably for the next three weeks, Game of Thrones, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to think about, you know, true. what's going to happen. <laughs> right, right, right. 
but yeah i'll be uh, you know our team will be there at various uh, conferences we'll be at uh, reinforce uh, dan elson from our team he'll be at cubecon in spain barcelona uh, next month i'll be at reinforce and then we'll be at uh, vm world and our team is applying we are you know we have cfps at a uh, lot of conferences uh, we are also uh, there active participants at vmugs oh, and nice. devops days so yeah you can find us there and you can also you know follow us uh, at cloud journey io or you can follow me on twitter and github at uh, i shrivats i shrivats okay yeah okay good good um what's most exciting uh most exciting yeah because uh, we did keep you up where are you going uh, uh -huh. what what, uh, what are you most excited about i'm most excited i think for our secure state release <laughs> i'm waiting for that and then uh we'll nice. take it from there yeah yeah very good very good um i know that people on uh hold on a minute talk shoe skype died just just a minute ago so if you're on uh if you're listening you can jump over uh, jump on Facebook. There we go. I gotta type that. <laughs> so there's a, there's a handful of people there, and they're not hearing us anymore because just about a minute ago we heard the in our oh, headphones. Wow. Yeah. That yeah. was that was Skype going. Yeah, we don't want to be online anymore. <laughs> um, which you know gets us into you know cloud services and debugging. Right? So <laughs> there you go. Um, I don't know. What else do we have to follow up with here in the last five minutes? Uh, you've talked about the you know, re uh, restate the the site where you can your blog again. It's it's cloudjourney.io hash move on dot. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so that's good. Um, yeah, Game of Thrones. We talked about that. That's important. You know, yeah. you, you need you need to know where your Game of Thrones is. So exactly. I'm very excited about the <laughs> waiting for the next episodes. Question for you. Mm -hmm. How many Game of Thrones episodes are there this season? I hear there's a, not as many. Six. I so think. There's, there's only six, and we're already on number three. Three already. So this thing, is, this thing is wrapping up, right? We've only yeah. got three more left. This explains a lot. After watching episode three, I was taken aback on how quickly things are moving along. Yeah, right? it was yeah. a pretty long episode. It was, it was a long episode. Like yes, an hour and 20 minutes, I want to say? Something, Something crazy like that. Like yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. Normally they're an hour, right? Normally yeah. they're an hour, yeah. It's like one and a half hour or Yeah, so. yeah. This one was an <laughs> extended uh, Game of Thrones. So, good, good. Sorry, just had to, since we've got, the, got to here, <laughs> thought we would, we would do that. Uh, you'll be at VMworld. Um, have you submitted any papers? Yeah, I've submitted uh, some papers for VMworld as well as some code sessions. Oh, nice. Uh, so, yeah. right. so we'll, we'll do a shout back. out. Yep, well, when you if you if you get one, uh, I'm certain you'll get a code session because you know security is one of those things that uh, everybody's going to have to deal with in the the, the cloud cloud environment. And I think actually, if you look at cloud operations, it's probably going to be the number one thing that you do as a cloud operator, right? Um, it's the number one thing you worry about anyway. Right, right. Keeping it up. Because you don't have to worry about keeping the, the servers up now. That's right. the cloud, the clouds people's it's their job, job, right? Yeah. You, you know, the, the Kubernetes runs the deployment and the management mm -hmm. of all the, the apps that are running out there and the de developer teams, you're interacting with them. So what do you have to do? You have to watch for performance um, mm -hmm. and, and security. You have to watch for cost and right. Right. security. Yeah. yeah, cost, performance, and security. Yeah, right. and we have products in all each, these three. Each of those, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, that's the other thing that, that yeah, are we going to bundle this stuff over time? Like it's, it seems like we're getting, we have a cloud health. We have, we have these different point products that we've acquired and wait, you don't have to answer this because this but, is just, uh, you're looking for a new suite. Well, when, when I first came to VMware, you know, 12 years ago, you know, you just bought ESX, right? Right. And then we invented vSphere, which is basically a bundle of the stuff you would actually need to run a data center mm -hmm. from a compute perspective. And there just seems to be this cloud services mm -hmm. set yeah. of things that we're, we're, we're talking through between security. PKS and cloud health and now secure state. So I, I see a bundle. I see a bundle in our, in our future. Really? Yeah. People yeah. hate bundles, but yeah. I, what I, what I do see that's very interesting is, you know, we, we've moved from this, you know, dev and ops and, you know, to DevOps, right? Yeah. And then, of course, we start hearing about DevSecOps. Right. Right. So one thing that you mentioned was, like, integrating that those security concerns and that uh, idea of, of audit and, you know, policy 
into that process so you, you don't have the violation in the first place when you're doing the development exactly right and then not you know needing to do this like you know one audit or like you know quote unquote continuous audit like only after you go into production yeah like that's the <laughs> the wrong attitude to have and it, it's so interesting that these tools are now starting to become available and and you know have that integration into the process to to you know get that good outcome the first time you know yeah uh, so i'm really excited I, i'm excited about the future it's also interesting this has nothing to do with vsphere right yeah yet another product that we're coming out that doesn't have anything to do with the virtualization it has to do with cloud operations right and then it's also a point to to our opening where you know when we are announcing you know that we are multi-cloud and that we have these cloud services that we actually have products and bundles of products and uh people like yourself going out to aws and uh and now what's it called aws secure what's the the reinforce reinforce, reinforce right and uh, we're talking about going to reinvent again this year the, the community team is so yes. we're we've getting our costs in line to, to show back up at reinvent mm -hmm. again and take Alistair and crew. So again, it's, 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 it's moving the boat, you know, it's broadening the ocean, I guess. Mm -hmm. so like, I don't know if we're turning the boat, but we're just, you know, we just have more uh, ocean to sail around in now. And we're doing a pretty good job, you know, putting mm -hmm. products in places that, you know, it practitioners need. And then from an it practitioner standpoint, you know, you can stay with VMware, learn about these things, get, get, get access to products. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, expand your your viability into running a, a vibrant it career for another yeah. 20 years yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah nice all right well uh what is your twitter handle so people can give you a follow uh it's uh, i shrivats i s h r i v a t s a i'm pretty new to twitter i'm learning from my uh teammates sean and tim they're like <laughs> pros all right well, well we'll get you some followers so repeat that again i I Shrivat. Right. I S H R I V A T S A. V A T S. I just I just tag uh, I uh, you know at Vjourneyman. I just tweeted out the picture of your uh, laptop with oh. identity and access management, and I, I tagged you in the picture. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Great. Uh, and then uh, the last but not least, we have a barbecue report uh, from Tony. But because the the line is not on we're gonna to have to jump over to facebook.com where we're live streaming uh, which we will do vmtn community and we'll check out what tony has to say i know he's been barbecuing <laughs> i'm gonna do some jerk check chicken this weekend for Ooh, sure yum. and i got plant plantons and i've been learning how to make nice yummy plantons so that's good so barbecue report from tony foster he grilled a shiitake mushroom a, a couple of days ago and uh those were a fail oh no <laughs> <laughs> yeah. crispy shiitake mushrooms apparently huh uh i'm sorry to hear that uh tony you know maybe uh next week you can get it right and uh, we'll keep talks you up and you can join us and tell us how to do it properly yeah. yeah yeah i personally like everything charred so i would probably like a crispy t t t <laughs> mushroom i'm back with my uh smoker this weekend uh chicken thighs my old standard nice yeah you can't go wrong with that it's beautiful weather outside it's the time um we we opened up planted our garden this uh, Ooh. uh yeah this uh, this weekend so put in tomatoes as always and cucumbers and lettuce and you know standard vegetable garden stuff but uh <laughs> good time if you're in california to plant a little garden even if you got a back door right yeah so outside barbecuing plant some garden you know got my kite surfer maybe i'm gonna Ooh. get out into that freezing cold <laughs> muddy bay turquoise blue bay and right. get, get some kite surfing done but uh well, all right green, but okay all right. Well, it's the end of the show. Thanks a lot for uh, saying hello, everybody on Facebook. Hey, thanks again. Um, for, we'll be a back again next week. Until then, have some great barbecue and enjoy the good we weather wherever you are, around the globe or around the nation. Talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye.